Greetings, book lovers everywhere. I'm E Train, and welcome to E Train Talks. And today is the best day ever. I've had the honor of talking to some pretty incredible authors and book enthusiasts since I began my podcast. But today's interview is extremely special to me because I'm overjoyed. And if I'm being totally honest, a little bit nervous to be talking to one of the greatest middle grade magical storytellers ever. I'm talking about the one and only, recently named number one New York Times bestselling author of the incredible middle grade fantasy adventures, Amari and the Night Brothers, and Amari and the Great Game. I'm talking to B.B. Austin. (laughs) Awesome. I'm so happy to be here, man. Talk to you. (laughs) I'm so happy to talk to you as well. This is like a dream come true because I've loved your books before I even reviewed books. Amari just always made me smile. And when I heard that there was a book two coming out, I was ecstatic. I knew I had to pre-order it immediately. And eventually, I knew I had to add it the first book ever to... My book drive, everything. I had to promote it as much as I could because I loved it so much. And I now I have the chance to interview you. That's that's like, whoa. <laughs> man, I'm, I'm equally excited to talk to you, man. I'm, I'm saying, I, I kind of see what you've been doing talking to other authors, and man, it's, it's so impressive. Oh, um, I wish you. I was that impressive at your age, you know? So I'm happy <laughs> well, to be here. <laughs> you really are. You have a movie coming out about Amari <laughs> and the Night Brothers. You have books. That's something... That's a life goal for me. You have two <laughs> books out that are extremely popular and so important. And for those who aren't aware, B.B. Alston's books have been published in over 30 countries. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and that's <they> a lot. <laughs> countless awards. Not to mention, they're just downright the best. Awesome. Like, it doesn't matter how many awards they win. I'm going to love them no matter what. Oh, I mean, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. So, just thank you for everything. And sit back, everyone, relax, and listen as I talk with the creator of our favorite supernatural heroine, Amari. And my first question for you is also a bit of a statement. So Amari and the Night Brothers and Amari and the Great Game are two of my favorite novels of all time. I love all the action, adventure, and magical themes, and I appreciate the meaningful elements as well. And I'm curious to know a little bit more about the characters. Do you base your protagonists on people in your life or are they born purely from your imagination? So Amari is a lot, it's based a lot on how I felt that age, um, just kind of, you know, how I saw myself. I, you know, I was kind of in the same situation. Mm-hmm. I was kind of from modest means and I would go to these summer camps, well, science camps. I, I didn't go to the any supernatural world, but I went to like these science camps on the other side of town and you know, I didn't have as much as much as far as they did, as far as money wise, and so I kind of did feel kind of less than they did, and feel like I didn't fit in all the time. So, um, I, Amari is pretty much based on how I felt and how I had to kind of learn to grow into my self confidence and self acceptance. Um, but everybody else is just kind of a uh, kind of a, a mismatch of other people. Like as far as like Elsie, the best friend, like she's kind of a mismatch of all my best friends. Kind of the great stuff I like about them, um, how supportive they are, how caring they are. Um, so yeah, I think. Um, um, they're just kind of a mismatch of different people. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, I love that. And I think that when authors base their characters off people in their lives and themselves, that just makes for an amazing story. Because I love when there's imaginative characters, but when there's a mishmash of everyone in your life, the book just feels that much more authentic and real. Like, it's hard to make a supernatural novel feel real, but you certainly did that and a lot awesome. more. Awesome. So awesome. now I want to ask about the Amari and the Night Brothers film being developed by <laughs> Universal Studios. <laughs> when I first read the news, I could not believe that one of my favorite books is going to be a movie. That's always the best feeling ever. So what was the process like for signing a movie deal for Amari? And what stage of the production are you in? <laughs> so right now we're um, in pre-production still. Um as far as like when we when we when we um, signed the movie, it was kind of all at the same time. Um, uh, there was a lot of excitement when Amari first got uh, signed uh, for book deals. Um, I'm not sure if you know about the book fairs, but there's these big book fairs in like Frankfurt and Bologna. Oh, uh, Bologna? I always say that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so they they have these big book fairs where you have book people there and movie people there and. Uh, all kind of like authors and agents and everything. Everybody kind of gets together to talk about books. And my book was there and uh, there's a lot of excitement about it. Um, and so uh, when I got my literary agent, she actually got uh, I'm a film agent at that same fair. And Ooh. so um, it got shopped out to my film agent. She loved it. And then she sent it out to all the, all the production companies and, and they loved it in studios. 
And so there was an auction, actually an auction for the for the movie rights. And so that was really exciting. Um, um you, you, got to, you got to kind of hear people different different studios' visions for the book, which was kind of cool. Um, I got to talk to Don Cheadle on the day Avengers came out, which is really cool. Um, and then uh, I got to pick the people who I, I thought was best for. And I love the idea of Marseille Martin being a part of it. I think she's amazing. And Don Cheadle and Mandeville, they did the um, live action Beauty and the Beast movie. Um, and so, I mean, it's just, it's just been amazing, a blast. Uh, I've got to read a few versions of the script, and it's, it's really good so far. We're in the process of looking for a director right now. And so um, we're going to kind of see how that turns out. And we should have like a final answer as far as like when the book, when the, when the movie starts getting filmed and when it'll get released. We should have that by the end of the year. So fingers crossed, you know, everything turns out super good. <laughs> wow. I... <laughs> I could not wait for that movie. And <laughs> I I just think that's so cool. Like everybody lined up for the Amari and the Night Brothers movie rights. And they it's certainly so deserving. And I also think that it's really interesting that two years or so before the book even came out, it was already gonna be a movie, like mm-hmm. as a book and a movie, a double whammy. <laughs> and I just think that that's so awesome that you get the news that your book's gonna be a movie. Then you have the actual book tour and mm-hmm. now you have book two in the series. Mm-hmm. And now I have a question. Do you have, is there going to be a book three and what's, what's it going to be about? I think if I didn't have a book three, my readers would be like really mad at me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so there's definitely a book three. I'm writing it right now. Um, um, as no, I, I'm trying to say that I spoil too much. There's a yeah. big thing that happens at the end of book two. Yeah. Um, and so it's basically Amari kind of dealing with that, all that, all the fallout of what happens. Um, the first two books are kind of based in the um, in the bureau primarily. Um, he, she kind of leaves and comes back a few times, but it's mainly, mainly in the bureau. But book three is going to be like totally outside the bureau, so Whoa. you get you, you kind of get to see a, a a really good idea of how the known world and the supernatural world kind of mix and match and kind of interact. Uh, so I hope readers get excited for it. I think it's going to be it's, it's really fun to write. So I hope, I hope it's really fun to read too. <laughs> I know it's going to be, and there was this huge huge cliffhanger at the end of Amari and the Great Game and I was so close to just oh but then I remembered oh yeah there's gonna be a book three calm down calm down so I cannot wait to see what happens and it's so hard not to spoil the books because there's just so much that I want to share but everybody you're gonna have to read them to find out what's what happens to Amari and learn more about the other characters along the way like Elsie, Dylan mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I read that you started your writing journey in middle school writing horror stories which is mm-hmm. very cool but <laughs> instead of pursuing writing you actually ended up studying pre-med in college. That's mm-hmm. quite a change in career choices yeah. and I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling grateful that you found your way back to writing but can you share what changed in your life? Did something or someone inspire you to change directions and find your way back to writing? So um, uh, it's funny because I didn't actually do college until my thirties. Like I was, I was kind of the, you know the kid didn't know what they want to do when they got out of high school. Yeah. Um, and so I, I worked at kind of like odd jobs, like I worked at the post office and Home Depot and all kind of like odd little jobs. But writing was always something I did for fun. Like like you said, I started in the eighth grade. Um, I wrote these horror stories. They were so corny, and it would always be like a field trip that went terribly wrong. Um, my classmates would kind of gather around and see who made it to the end of the, end of the story. Um, and that's when I first realized that, like, man, something I write makes people happy. And that's kind of cool. So from there, I just I just kind of wrote for myself, though. Come after the eighth grade, I was kind of nervous about sharing my writing with other people. I was kind of nervous about people reading it. And so this is kind of something I did for fun. Um, and then I said, in my, in my 30s, I was just like, you know what? You're not getting no younger. Let's just go for it. And so I went for it. Um, we got, like, no's and many, many rejections. <laughs> and so I was like, well, right, it's probably not probably not working out for me and that's when I actually went to school for pre-med and I you know I got my I got all, it's when I got all A's in my pre-med but those classes are so boring and so <laughs> I was like I need something to break up these classes and so I said well I'm done with writing but maybe if I just work on like this cool idea I have about um you know the men in black world where you, instead of aliens there's like all kind of supernatural creatures um how would that agency be different how would things work if you had the uh, agency have to deal with all these things and so I would just kind of have fun playing around with um you know, with the world. I didn't have any idea of any 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 idea of kind of changing that to a story because I was like, I'm done with writing, I tried it, it didn't work, so I'm done with it. And so um I was doing that one day and Amar just kind of popped into my head. And I was like, oh man, I know how she spoke, how she thought, how she talked. And I was like, man, I got a character and I got a world. 
like, how can I not make a story out of that? And so that's kind of where I got inspiration for it from. It's um, uh, this kind of I had this idea, this cool idea, and a character popped into my head, and I just said, let's, let me just go for it one more time. And yeah, it's funny because I was getting ready to move to pursue medicine and guys go to medical school, and um, that's when I found that's when I sent a tweet off, and everything kind of happened from there. And so <laughs> kind of a twist in my life journey. <laughs> Well, school pre-med, let's do let's some writing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and it certainly paid off, like the bouncing and all that, because then you mm-hmm. got an agent, your book's mm-hmm. going to be a movie, it's a New York Times bestseller, book two yeah. is number one, and yeah. like all these different lists, and you're not a doctor, but you're an award-winning and like world-famous author, so that's pretty good too. That's pretty good, yeah, I, I, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's... I love these stories like when I when not only ideas pop in your head but also like your life really takes twists and turns and Mm -hmm. like a lot of bumps along the way but Amari came and yeah Amari's a heroine in both reality and in books yeah for sure she definitely changed my life so I'm I'm, I'm pretty excited (laughs) yeah and I'm excited for book three and all the other adventures that you're going to be writing about because I know that Everybody wants to read some more stories from you. No pressure or anything. Um, <laughs> so your debut novel, Amari and the Night Brothers, was released right before COVID, a couple months before it, actually. Mm-hmm. And then it hit, the COVID hit, and events had to be held virtually. How mm-hmm. did this impact your book tours, class visits, and more? Did it have a positive impact, negative impact, or both? Well, you know, I, I thought it would have a negative impact just because, you know, you know, you have all these things planned out, everywhere you're going to go, and it's like, nope, you're not going on those places, and then, but what we, what we found is that, you know, with virtually, you can you can see so many more people, because there's no travel involved, right, whereas in one week, maybe you can have to go all the way across country to meet somebody and do an event, um, in that same, in that same week, you can, you can have, like, seven different virtual events for seven different, seven different um, groups of people in different parts of the country, I said, that was kind of cool. I, I mean, I got used to uh, talking to people through Zoom, <laughs> kind of like this. That's why, um, yeah. that's why I, I love doing these type of things. Um, you get used to talking to people about the books, and it's exciting. You get to meet more people. And so I, I feel like it's been a positive for me, um, just having the opportunity to meet more people than I would have. I had to try, I'll con- constantly travel back and forth to different places. So definitely yeah. a positive for me. <laughs> was there someone who inspired you to pursue writing, a parent, teacher, author, or a model? um not so much anybody that inspired me uh maybe just my love of reading honestly um I you know uh I can remember back my first book that I ever remember loving was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory oh, yeah. just because uh it was a kid kind of like I was it's kind of like you know didn't come from a whole lot didn't even kind of modest means but you didn't let that stop from having these big dreams and big plans for the world and um so ever since then I just you know I, I've kind of you know, like man you know ever since I learned that people write books that's good, kind of a thing where I was like man wouldn't that be fun if I could make my own yeah. stories and so that's kind of what I did for fun on my own. And um, I mean, I guess all the people I've read has inspired me in some way. Um, um, more recently, maybe like a more like an Angie Thomas or uh, Nick yeah. Stone, those type of authors have inspired me just because they've had such a great impact. And uh, they both did the yeah, right. right book. You know, I mean, it, it's just, that, that was so cool. For me. That was such like a life goal moment for me to have them read the book and like it. So um, definitely so many inspirations, uh, mainly other authors that write books that I love and enjoy. So that's what I would say. So this is a bit of a, like, kind of not as lighthearted, but like, because there's book bannings, mass book bannings yeah. all over, and it's Banned Books Week coming up this month, and I just want to know, what's your response to the mass book bannings across the country, just, and why should we kids care? I think you should care because, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's so important because books represent everybody and it's so important for everybody to see themselves in books and I think it's, it's really dangerous for you to take for you to take for you to tell kids that you know there's only a certain type of kid that deserves to see themselves in stories and um I mean because what what, what, what what yeah I think what message you're sending to the kids that that aren't like that like since whether you're a different you know different gender different orientation different ideas you know when, when you when you're saying that only these certain books represent these certain people are are you know are uh, good books or are books that should be read by kids and you're kind of excluding a whole group of people and you're telling them that their stories don't matter and I think that's just a dangerous thing to tell people and so I think kids should ma- kids should care because you know it's, it's, it's essentially you guys that are writing books for and um you know if you're one of those kids who maybe you don't see yourself represented or you're 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 you're, to- you're you find yourself being told that your stories don't matter 
I mean, gosh, I just, I don't know. I just, I just, I, I, I just had, I, I, I just, I've grown up in a situation where I didn't see a lot of kids like they look like myself in those kind of in books and, and fantasy books, and so I kind of know how that feels a little bit. Not to the extent where they're like, bam, I just didn't see them. So I can imagine what it must feel like to have adults just say, yeah, your stories don't matter, and we, we, we can't read about you. And so, man, I just, I just kind of feel for those kids, and I, I hope you know we get to a point where we can, we can celebrate all stories and realize that all stories matter. And so, yeah, that's that's what I would say. Yeah, <laughs> I've got to say. Your answers today have been so, so captivating. And I am i know that we talked a lot about the books, your, mm-hmm. all your books and your writing journey, but I'm just curious to know, and I'm sure everyone is, are there any facts that you can share about yourself, maybe just one that few readers might not know about you? Ah, uh, let me think. Um, see, I would say the pre thing, name, but we already talked about that. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. I guess my favorite hobby is just driving on country roads, especially like in South Carolina where I live at. Um, it's not like any, it's not like in like huge cities. So there's like a bunch of country roads and you might, you know, you might go travel on down one and see like a, a historical landmark, like a, a church or a, a graveyard or something cool like that. Um, so yeah, this is my favorite thing. It's just to kind of get on country roads and drive and explore the back, the little back roads. So yeah. I know that you're also a big fan of sweets. Oh and yeah. So, What's your go-to treat? Oh gosh, I got I have so many. Um, I have these little bars that I eat. These, these little uh, cashew bars. They're like so good. Oh, um, I love Nature Valley. Yeah, they're so good. And then, but I mean, I'll eat I'll eat anything that's sweet. Like cup, I got cupcakes in there. I've got uh, Snicker bars, paydays. Oh my gosh, uh, cake. It's really it's really a problem at this point. Like, <laughs> it, oh man, I just anything sweet. I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> You you should meet my mom. She'll eat anything sweet yeah. or a lot of mostly anything. <laughs> so, I was going to send you a Twix, but maybe if it, um maybe not if you have a little bit of a problem. <laughs> you, you have a pretty nice collection, I have to say. Yeah, I, 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 my, my wife she's always getting them about. She always gets in my case about eating sweets, but then she'll 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 always grab me something out of your <laughs> So she's, she's like helping me out with my sweet, my sweet addiction. <laughs> and now I'm, it's time for our final question of the day. The question okay. I ask everybody I interview, if you could be or meet any literary character, fictional or real, who would it be and why? Oh man, I would, um, if I could be or meet, let's see. Hmm. You know, I would love to, I would love to meet like a rocket, like, like a roll doll maybe like a Maya Angelou or something like that. It's, it's like a great mind, like a great like story or literary mind and just kind of see if it's some tick and uh, get that, get their writing tips and, you know, see how they work. Um, as far as a character, hmm. and there's so many fun characters. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind being like a Percy Jackson. That'd be pretty fun. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I think it'd be kind of fun to be a demigod. That'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, maybe not the almost dying part, but yeah, exactly. every other part. <laughs> For sure. I learned so much, and I'm sure everybody listening did as well. And we all thank you so much for joining us today on Eat Train Talks. And because it's been amazing talking to you. We all love your novels. And for the one for the people who haven't read them yet, they're going to love them too. <laughs> and I love opening a book and feeling so captivated that I feel like I'm traveling along with the characters on their journey. And that's just exactly what happens to Amari readers. And the only problem is we now have to wait for your next book to continue our journey. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to keep clicking refresh on the, on the Amazon page to pre-order <laughs> the next Amari book. And yeah. while I do that, have an amazing day. And I think we can all, I can speak for all middle grade readers when I say, thank you so much for choosing writing. Oh, you, made you, all reading. Readers, you made all your readers <laughs> smile, cheer, and just love reading. You've inspired reluctant readers to read. You've inspired me to explore new genres. And I feel I thought I had explored every single genre. <laughs> so and thank you to the best duo in the world, BB Alston and Amari. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, it's been a huge pleasure talking to you. <laughs> and I love your caps, by the way. Oh, I, awesome. <laughs> I was gonna wear it. <laughs> and to everybody listening. You need to read Amari and the Night Brothers. Amari and the Great Game. Well, first, Amari and the Night Brothers, because 
the Mari, if you read a Mari in the Great Game first, I kind of spoil everything. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, yeah. So check out <laughs> Mari and the Night Brothers. Read it, love it, because you will. And then guess what? You have book two to look forward to and read. And then book three. And that's it for today. I've loved talking with the amazingly talented BB Alston. And be sure to read his Amari books, as I've said many times. And just until we meet again, everybody, keep reading, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.